have such sights to show you. We're popping the Scary Horror Podcast here. I'm your host, Cole, and with me, as always, I have my good friend and co-host, Aaron. Hello. Aaron, let me hear you scream! Ah! <laughs> Thank you. I did not want to bust a microphone. I was like, I'm going to have to edit this so loud to where it just sounds like, oh! I didn't want to peek it out. You know? No, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, that's that's probably the most clever intro I will ever have on the entirety of this podcast here. Um, and I literally came up with that just now. Um, yeah, we are oh, checking no. out the third installment of Scream. Now, Aaron, it, it's funny whenever it comes to reviewing series on this podcast so <laughs> far, because by the time we get to the third entry, I usually have a pretty good gauge on where you're at on the, like, okay. I'm done with this franchise uh-huh. or... Okay, I'm curious about what's more and everything yeah. else. Like for instance, Saw, I think by the third one you're like, I'm done. <laughs> I don't I don't I do not care about seeing the rest of the series. I am I, I wouldn't complain if we watched another one, but yeah, on my own I probably wouldn't watch it. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So it kind of makes me a little worried and curious because Scream is arguably maybe my second favorite franchise, mm-hmm. although who knows with how my reviews have been because with me i love the first entry Mm -hmm. of scream second one definitely revisiting it the rose colored glasses kind of came off a bit Mm -hmm. like because i think whenever i watched it the first time i was riding off the high of the first one and just like man i'm watching the scream films and then watching it again with you i was like i was actually probably a lot more harsher on it than you were Mm -hmm. whereas really with the scream franchise so far you've been lukewarm too you're like it's yeah. okay. Well, I think in retrospect, mm-hmm. I like it a lot more than I do maybe coming off the, cu- the cuff of it. I'm um I'm like I like the vibe a lot. I'm looking forward to watching this because it's a little bit of a fresher breath air. I think compared to some of the films we watch on our podcast and some of the stuff I've been watching. In my like I just came off watching like Baby Reindeer, like, uh, and I'm like I'm, I need something fun. <laughs> <laughs> I need something a little more energy in it, you know. Um, you know, just in my personal viewing habits, so. I'm glad that we're we're watching Scream because Scream's always a fun time that doesn't take itself too seriously. So um, I think it's going to be enjoyable, regardless of what I might think of its place in cinematic history or whatever. I think it's going to be a, a fun time, whatever. Uh, yeah, God, I hope so. Because yeah. <laughs> again, if, if if memory serves, I'm I'm writing very vaguely on some of the stuff. Um, and I'll hold my feelings on it so that way I don't lean on it one way or another. But I will give you this. Mm -hmm. This was the last entry in the franchise before they returned to the fourth one Mm -hmm. 11 years later. So, because the first one was released in 96, Mm -hmm. the second one 97, this one came out in 2000. Okay. So there was definitely a big, big break, like a Mm -hmm. decade break in between films. So this is kind of like it's obviously not the end of the franchise or trilogy or something like that, but Mm -hmm. it is sort of like the, okay, this is where we cap ended before they came back and revisited it. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're psyched about it there. Um, we will be right back as we figure out, uh, who ghost faces this time. (laughs) Here's a critical thing. If you find yourself dealing with an unexpected backstory and a preponderance of exposition, then the sequel rules do not apply. Because you are not dealing with a sequel. You are dealing with the concluding chapter of a trilogy. Trilogy. That's right. It's a rarity in the horror field, but it does exist. And we are back from experiencing Scream 3. So, Aaron, Mm -hmm. with this, uh, at the time, conclusive end to the trilogy, how was it, bud? I'd give it three screams up. Woo! <laughs> Siskel and Ebert give it three screens <laughs> up. <laughs> no, really. I was looking for a fun time. It delivered. It was, I think, feel like it did a great job with its sort of meta commentary style. It really leaned mm-hmm. into that aspect of it in this movie, and I think appropriately and, and in, uh, you know, in a good way. Um, 
I mean, I liked the actors. I liked the sort of twists and turns. Although, you know, I can I can say some stuff about the ending because there's all these movies are always a whodunit, you know. <laughs> and so we can always talk about that at the end. But um, yeah, no, I think overall it was an enjoyable experience. I liked the setting. I liked some of the playfulness they did, referencing the other movies and how the plot was sort of driven by, you know the plot before but also literally a hollywood plot as it gets set in a studio and um yeah the, the sort of meta commentary not just on um the previous scream films being adapted into film but also um you know referencing movie shit as they are you know somewhat aware not they're not that they're aware that they're in a movie but that they uh they follow the structure of the movie and talk about it out loud as if you know the, 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 the rules of this movie are going to follow that because they do. Um, so I'm rambling a little bit. But no, no, I thought it was a good overall fun romp with an interesting angle that was executed well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, glad that you're feeling that way about the film and everything. Because mm-hmm. I'm going to be completely honest. I watched all three of the Scream films back to back. I want to say, oh, geez, like around 2011, oh, I yeah. think. Yeah, so I was way it's late to the minute. party. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a hot minute. And so, anyways, whenever I watched um, the Scream franchise, uh-huh. this is how it was the first time I watched it. First one, absolutely loved it. Mm-hmm, Second mm-hmm. one, thought it was pretty good at the time. But mm-hmm. obviously, if you listen to my episode, that definitely differed. Mm-hmm. And the third one... I remember not liking at all oh, really? and thinking it was so dumb and stupid <laughs> and everything else. Having watched it again, like, good lord, over a decade later mm-hmm. in the nice uh, restored 4K edition, it's dumb as hell, but I love that boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a blast. It is it, a good time. Like, because my thing that I experienced while watching this film a third time is the second one... I would argue it's probably a bit more of a sound movie, mm. b- a bit, you know, looking at it. But, it, and while it did try to do some goofy, fun stuff or whatever, mm-hmm. I just felt like it just still, it just kind of leaned towards stupid. Whereas mm-hmm. this one, the stupid stuff that happens goes in a full circle to where it becomes amazing, essentially. Right, right, right yes. Because yeah. they go so far pushing the absurdity mm-hmm. of some situations that um i was definitely happy because whenever you were like yeah i'm looking for a fun goofy time i'm like i remember not liking this film very much i think this is going to be a bad time no it was great granted is it a better movie in my opinion than the first one no i still hold the first one in high regard and everything else Mm -hmm. but i like this movie a ton uh i had a blast with it as well it was very fun seeing some of the um scene setups they did and the kills um again just the chase that that's one of the interesting thing about the scream films like the kills like how they die mm-hmm. yeah sure that's good but i feel like i just kind of acknowledge this the chase scenes are way more unique yeah. than usual slasher things because usually great point. yeah like they really think about it and again it's stupid observe over the top stuff But I felt like it worked out great. And the fact that a lot of it does take place in, like, Hollywood and everything, they Mm -hmm. really take advantage of that. And they have these cool sets and everything, both just for the film and sets within the film. Right, right, right. Which ends up being a lot of fun. And I was genuinely surprised. Now, granted, there's definitely some character moments where I'm like, Whew, okay, that's a, <laughs> that's some acting right there, you sure. know. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, clear the room of that smoke there, essentially. But I feel like the stuff that I could criticize is doesn't diminish the amount of fun I have with this film. Yeah, it doesn't uh, taper it down a bit. And in all honesty, I wish uh, the second one might have done that. But again, maybe it's just sort of like the offset that I remember mm-hmm. liking two better Then I revisit and I'm like, Oh, it's not as good as I remember. And then this one is, Oh, I hated this third one, which I think I could talk about the reasons why I disliked it the first time, mm-hmm. obviously spoilers. Um, but this time I enjoyed it a lot more and maybe it's because of how absurd the third one is that mm-hmm. maybe I was kind of like, Oh, I don't know, but not really acknowledging that the Scream franchise is 
absurd. fairly absurd. Yes. Even the first one's pretty <laughs> absurd. Oh, very, yes, yes, um, yes. Especially with like how over the top like Matthew Lillard was mm-hmm. and uh, Skeet Ulrich there, mm-hmm. um, and that could have been just me as well, just kind of not acknowledging the absurdity of it at the time. So. Yeah, but I had a really great time. This was honestly one of the more fun movies I feel like we've watched on this podcast. So, yeah. yeah. So, the plot of Scream 3 focuses on the fact that Sidney Prescott has uh, taken it to herself to hide out in the woods because... You know, she's been hunted down twice by this point, and she's like, nope, not taking any chances, <laughs> right. and basically locks herself up in seclusion, essentially has that place on lockdown and everything else. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to stop uh, Ghostface from uh, popping back up and uh, seeking out uh, vengeance on even more victims that happen to be tied to the Woodsboro murders and basically the whole lineup of the Scream murders that have occurred. Mm -hmm. And because of this, uh, Gail Weathers is back on the scene, and so is Dewey, and they have to end up recruiting the help of Sidney Prescott as they try to figure out exactly who Ghostface is this time. Mm -hmm. Um... Looking at it, uh, it, it's one of those things where I feel like the plot definitely makes sense. Like, you know, in the second film, Sydney's like, okay, I'm going to college. That murder thing's over. Mm -hmm. Definitely traumatic, but I could continue on with life. But after the events of the second one, she's like, nope, I am just locking myself up and working at home. Security systems everywhere. I have a dog to protect me. Mm -hmm. I am locked down. I ain't going nowhere. So I kind of like that. I think that's another reason why I love Sydney Prescott as the final girl. Like, she's my favorite final girl. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact that they amp it up more and more each sequel. Like, it's not just one of those, like, ditzy, like, oh, I'm just gonna run around. Right, right. She. I feel like a lot of the characters have pretty reasonable Mm -hmm. reactions to the shit they go through, even though it is a really goofy movie. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? They're, they're, yeah, like, Sydney's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I, I got a gun in the house, I got three security systems, I got a dog, I got people checking in on me, like, I'm not taking any more chances, and it's like, yes, thank you, thank God that we're not <laughs> on the, the third episode, and they're like, well, let me just walk down the basement by myself and not tell anybody, <laughs> Oops. Oh my God, yeah, and uh, that's what I appreciate, and, you know, Wes Craven, uh, he directed all three of these films and everything, mm-hmm. so... Uh, the fact that I feel like it is under the same director does bring comfort to me, even mm-hmm. if I don't like Scream 2 as much as I thought I did previously. Mm-hmm. You can listen to my thoughts on that episode later. Um, but yeah, I really like that. And the fact that whenever it does come to the murders, like it's realistic. Like yeah. Ghostface is not able to find Sydney hardly at all. Like right. they're, he's only able to essentially um, call her up maybe once, essentially. Mm -hmm. But there's also the fact that Sydney's also dealing with a lot of, like, internal drama, so she's having a lot of these traumatic events, Mm -hmm. sort of, like, schizophrenia going on, seeing things, because she is haunted by her past. So that ends up playing a big part in it as well, on Mm -hmm. how much she's actually seeing him. So because of that, a lot of the focus is a lot of the people living in Hollywood because during this time, they are making Stab 3, which I find hysterical that in between Scream 1 and Scream 3, they have made, well, they've made two Scream films already Mm -hmm. and they're releasing a third one currently, which is funny because 2 had the making, uh, they had just released Stab 1, essentially. So in this time frame, they have released another sequel, which... I do find amusing, um, and it's, um, I don't, I don't know how to feel about, like, Gail and Dewey coincidentally being brought in, because, again, Mm -hmm. they were, like, in Woodsboro, and then they all happened to be in L.A. at the same time there, because Dewey's supposed to be a consultant on the film, because, Mm -hmm. obviously, he was on the force during that time. And then Gail is working with one of the detectives to find it. Mm -hmm. It's like one of those things I'm like, okay, it's a little too coincidental, but nothing that, like, makes me think this is absurd. Honestly, by Mm -hmm. horror movie standards, I was like, that's a perfect explanation as Mm -hmm. to why they're both here and with each other again. I I thought it was was pretty serviceable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it didn't throw me through. I was just like, okay, you know, bring it up. I think if anything was more distracting, it was... um, 
the bangs Courtney Cox was rocking in that film. <laughs> that that was the scariest thing I saw in the entire film. It was a scary haircut. There, there were a couple scary hairlines in mm. there, but yeah, that one, that one took the cake. Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, speaking of which, we've already talked a little bit about the uh, characters, I guess, in the midst of talking about the general idea of the plot. So mm. how's about we do dive into our wonderful uh, cast and crew here. Um, we've already mentioned it a little bit there, but let's talk about... Uh, Sydney Prescott, played by uh, Nev Campbell. Yeah. Um, I've already mentioned it before. She's my favorite final girl, so of course I'm going to have bias towards her. Mm -hmm. But I feel like she does a good job. And I love that th the amount of turmoil is like... She's just getting pissed off at this right, point right. that this keeps happening. Like, Because already she... And the first film I felt like was like not quite easily as afraid, but mm -hmm. obviously still really spooked. The second one, she is like like angry about this like no no this cannot be happening again the third one she's like are you fucking serious right right <laughs> like what the fuck and so i think that realistic sort of reaction because obviously she still shows like she's scared in some instances and if anything it's because of her own trauma she's going through that she is a lot more emotionally vulnerable right but at the same point she also I would like if I was the ghost face, I would be terrified with messing around with her essentially. Mm -hmm. I like I would need to come in a tank and be like Hello, Sydney. Thank you for this. <laughs> or something like that. Like I would, like that's the only way I would feel safe taking out Sydney Prescott at that point. Mm. You know, like she's basically going to become John Wick or some crap yeah. at this point. Yeah, this series is great for mm. fight like the survivors in general, but especially the final girl because they get to just beat the shit out of ghosts. That's one of the things I like. But at this point, <laughs> they, that, it's like an established trope of the screen franchise mm -hmm. is that like. Yeah, like, yeah, there's a guy trying to kill you, and he's pretty good at it, but he also can get the shit kicked out of him, and will. Like, mm -hmm. he is just a dude. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's kind of interesting if you look at slashers getting the hell beaten out of them. Mm -hmm. Like, Jason, it's always awesome seeing the hell beaten out of him, because right. he's like a tank. He just right. keeps coming back he just, up. He just takes it. Ghostface is like a Looney Tunes character, <laughs> where yeah. he looks like he's taken a lot of abuse, then magically he's just back up again. Right. You don't feel like he has, like, a sense of endurance. It's it's just like again you mentioned this before in the screen films how he moves spastically and yeah, stuff yeah that's why I think that's what makes mm -hmm. the chase scenes so great too is mm -hmm. you just see him running with his hand in the air with a knife like <laughs> I have to do some fucking xylophone as music for his footsteps, you know. Like he's he's kind of goofy, but the mm -hmm. whole the whole franchise is kind of goofy, and it's because there's always goofy people under the mask trying to uh, obsessive about movies or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah. It's so funny. We're we're trying to stay on track, but you and I, especially me, are getting sidetracked by other stuff we want to <laughs> mention. But True. yeah, Sydney Prescott. I feel like she does an amazing job. I felt like her performance was really solid. Yeah. And stuff. So definitely, whenever he mentioned some of the performances being kind of stale mm -hmm. and everything, she is exempt from that. Uh, clearly, um, love you, Nev Campbell. <laughs> yes, please yes. respond to my messages. Please, <laughs> please. My four thousand emails. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, moving on, uh, we have uh, Courtney Cox playing Gail Weathers again, and. Um, I am happy with this film because, like, that was the thing about the second film is that mm -hmm. I felt like everything kind of reset with the second film because right. at the end of the first film, she's like, yeah, you know what? Maybe I've learned not to be just, like, a bitchy reporter. Be a good person. And then, stuff. The and then film, the second, a bitchy reporter. Yes, and then the third one, she was just like, no, I I left that behind. I'm trying to I be actually, better. I don't I don't did not like Gail very much in the first couple of movies, mm -hmm. but I actually really liked her character in this movie because she's still that person, but has developed because I love she had a great line. Some of the dialogue of this movie is just amazing, but she, <laughs> she had a great line where she's like, "I swear on my Pulitzer that I plan to win one day." Or something <laughs> like. <laughs> I was like, "That is so Gail." Like she just has that level of like com like she thinks she's there, but also she is just like an entertainment trashy reporter but she like recognized that about herself a little bit she's like distancing herself from the book that she wrote she's like whatever i'm just here because i'm helping the police or whatever not mm -hmm. because i'm being gail weathers right now yeah and i feel like she's really uh great for that uh specifically as well and so i feel like it, it, and i think like in all honesty even though like Obviously, Sydney Prescott is still, I would consider, the main character. Yes. I feel like it almost focuses more on 
uh, Gail and Dewey yeah. kind of investigating, which makes sense because literally Sydney's like, Mm-mm, I'm not leaving. She right. doesn't leave her house until it gets to a certain point of like, okay, I have to leave right. in order to try to help things out, which is honestly good. That's mm-hmm. a good, realistic thing that you know immediately not in the first murder you know sydney's like i have to run out there right, right. essentially <laughs> she's just she's just like nah <laughs> right right nope 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 doing that essentially uh so yeah no and it's funny i i totally missed that pulitzer line but that sounds <laughs> uh amazing there essentially there's but a, there's a lot of great dialogue I, yeah in this movie yeah the thing is like i I don't know. I never know how to feel about the ship between her and Dewey. Mm-hmm. I'm always like half and half on it there, right. where it feels forced and cheesy, but also believable. I'm like being right. pulled back and forth with it. Because it was like sort of, it was like sort of a dynamic that was meant for a laugh, I think, in the first movie, and then they made two more, and they got to like kind of keep it going to some degree. But mm-hmm. I was like into it i guess they try to set up like a little bit of a love triangle thing in this movie and it like made sense they Mm -hmm. at least within the plot they acknowledge like we're different people or whatever but then maybe they grow closer together you know yeah no i think the love triangle definitely helps spice it up because they already went through that sort of trope in the second one Mm -hmm. just being like you know like oh, we broke up, it didn't work out, but then they fall in love again Mm -hmm. and everything. And, like, the reason why it broke up is because, like, Dewey was in a hospital taking a while to recover, and she was like, I get a big chance to go to Hollywood and make it big. I gotta take this. I'm sorry. Right. Essentially. And so you understand why Dewey is so uh, rough on that. Uh, Speaking of which, how about we... uh, end up talking about a uh, good old uh, Dewey McGee as it were in every day, uh played by David Arquette of course once again he is some of the ones where I can't be sure about his acting if it's bad acting or if it's just Dewey just being weird as hell. Right, yeah, cause, and I feel like mm-hmm. they toned down the Deweyness mm-hmm. by this point. Yes. Because he was definitely goofy, like, sidekick cop guy that was like, whoa, whoa, you know, like, he was supposed to be a little bit more cartoony, mm-hmm. I think, in the first one. And then by this point, he's like a character that they've had to establish, and so he has his, his quirks, but I feel like he's not as goofy as he was in the first couple movies yeah and you know maybe it took me a while to get used to like you know the do warm sort of thing right. there because like whenever you see him in the first scene he's like yeah then you left and he's like yeah, swinging his yeah, eyes doing yeah. like the clint squint or something <laughs> yeah, like that yeah. and i'm like i don't know if this is like a purposeful he's trying to act like he doesn't care but he does care mm-hmm. or if it's just a really bad line it was just no, like he's i think he's supposed to still be cheesy and mm-hmm. dumb <laughs> and that yeah. way, he has, definitely has cheesy and dumb lines <sighs> but you know i think like once he got to lighten up and be kind of like more on amicable terms with gail essentially mm-hmm. i got used to it but like the first one i was like Oh, what the fuck, David? What are you doing, man? <laughs> like, is, like, is, I, I'm guessing this is the intentional route or whatever, but mm. it just, it felt stagnant a little bit on my end there. Yeah. But as is, that was like kind of like nitpicky. That's whenever it started me having sweat at the beginning of the film where I'm like, oh God, <laughs> is this the beginning of the end, essentially? Unfortunately, it's not. Like, I, I feel like his performance gets better for me anyways towards the um, end of the film mm-hmm. there, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, Going to be honest, it's going to be kind of hard talking about the rest of the characters since they're kind of all lumped in together yeah. as well, essentially. Uh, so so um, There's like, what? So there's like a cast member for all of them, too, in the staff yeah. movies. <laughs> and I liked that. Yeah. It's funny because, like, in the um, in Scream 2, you see, um, you know, in Scream, uh, Scream 2... Watching the movie Stab, right. you see a double play um, Drew Barrymore's role in mm-hmm. the first Scream. And I was like, oh, that's cute, kind right. of seeing that play out there, essentially. But now we're seeing the people that were cast as the characters and everything, which it's it's really funny looking at that because we... I'm trying to remember, essentially, basically... You had uh, the actress who was casted to play Sydney Prescott for the film. Yes. You see the person that was cast playing Dewey in the film. Yes. And you see the person that was uh, cast playing... Um, 
Gale. Uh, There's a Gale Weathers Yes, person. yes, Gale, and then I'm trying to think of Sydney's friend's name. I That is escaping me. The blonde from the first Scream film. Yeah, I don't remember yeah, the name. Yeah, but... I, I remember the actress's n- n- the. Oh, man, it is so confusing. <laughs> it's like trying to keep this straight. I know... The character's name in the film that was portraying Sydney's best friend, uh-huh. uh, her name was uh, Sarah oh, Darling. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, Sarah, 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 yeah. Yes. Um, anyways, oh my God in heaven. Yeah, uh, but the best casting was for Jamie Kennedy's character, Randy, yeah. who is a complete race swap. Yeah, he's like the replacement. Yeah. He's which, like, I'm not a replacement, but he's like the replacement for that character. Yeah, and I thought that was great. That was perfect. I, I honestly do love that they did that, and I think it speaks on a lot of level about, like, at film adaptations in Hollywood, essentially, yeah, and how yeah. they take artistic liberties. I like, and they sort of played around with like the tokenism aspect. Like, I felt like he was like, he's like, I'm just here to be in a couple scenes and then get killed, and then you don't see him for like yeah. <laughs> for like thirty minutes. <laughs> like they were just like, we acknowledge this is a problem. We can't fix it. <laughs> <Right. laughs> they just like wrote it. They just wrote it in, which is funny. I feel like this this mm-hmm. movie does a lot of stuff on. There's like a lot of stuff that's mm-hmm. on the obvious level. Whenever they say mm-hmm. things like like that, the girl that plays Sarah has a line where she was like, "I'm getting murdered in the shower." Uh, they already did that. Hello, rear window <laughs> or whatever. No, she goes, "Hello, vertigo." Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's like it's like okay, at some level, like they're, the the banter about movies is like a little more obvious. But then, like at a structural level, even they do shit like that where he he like acknowledge he's like, "I'm only gonna be in a couple scenes and then get killed," and then you don't see him for like 45 more minutes. Oh my. God. God. Yeah, yo, it's a uh, it's a uh, fantastic to s- say the least seeing them. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you don't really get to know them uh, too too well. Like they're right. not deep characters, but again, they're mostly there just to add to the who done it aspect. Because that's a right. thing you have to have a big body in order to try to figure out right right so know. yeah in addition to all the whodunit cast there's literally there's like two detectives that are on the case mix mix suave big man and then his partner or whatever yes um and then there's also like the film's director and then like the, the producer and the um, studio head and there's all these people that get introduced that are part mm-hmm. of the film that might since the murders are all revolving around the stab movies that you're like who might it be yeah and like i'm gonna be honest I could, at the very least, like, go through each one and tell you your thoughts. In my books, they're all fine. Right, right. They are That's, all quite literally fine. I and... think we could definitely just, like, go to the next section. Yes, <laughs> just yeah. Just mention Thank all you. of them um, and be like, yeah. um, The only other thing I will throw <laughs> at that I actually didn't know, you in the one earlier scene, whenever they're on the set of Scream 3, mm-hmm. uh, the studio executive comes in whenever they're talking about canceling the film at first and yeah. Roman's talking about it. I did not know this, but uh, the guy that was playing the head studio executive was Roger Corman, who's, like, a Ooh. famous, like, movie filmmaker he made like the uh, little shop of horrors movie with oh, jack nicholson okay. so huh. he's like a big horror legend there essentially uh, so i thought that was a cool uh cameo. little cameo there it's not the only cameo we had with jay and silent bob <laughs> yes jay and silent bob <laughs> randomly appeared in the film and everything and as i was trying to figure out because there's this clip going around where it showed like a ghost face killing somebody on mm-hmm. set and i'm like i don't remember what movie this is from but it shows wes craven directing it and then jay and silent bob show up uh turns out uh that's not this film even though they do make a cameo but it's from jay and silent bob strike back which i know nothing about jay and silent bob never seen that or mall rats or nothing like that whatsoever i don't know if i'm missing out or not maybe i should keep being ignorant of that who knows (laughs) sorry uh kev (laughs) um but yeah so that was uh, the, the cameos in this film are really funny i'm not gonna lie just it's sticking out like a sore thumb you would think it would ruin the film but it almost just makes it enjoyable because like i feel like especially one cameo that shows up later they're very much wink wink nudge nudge Mm -hmm. with that like they're kind of reveling in the cameo and so i'm like this is fine i'm i'm perfectly fine with this there essentially like i have I am now submersed in the absurdity, <laughs> essentially. It is a very cameo-heavy film, which is cool because it is a film a lot about Hollywood and movies and, and breaking that fourth mm-hmm. wall anyways. So. Yeah, the only other character I could mention, and this is just a personal thing with me, sort of like that I love uh, Keith David, essentially. Mm. 
I completely forgot Patrick Warburton's in this film <laughs> as a guard, and he has very little lines, yeah. but he's just Patrick Warburton. He yeah. kills it every single time. He goes in, kills it, walks away. Like, that's just what he does there, essentially. No matter how small the part is, I'm st- I just, he's like one of my favorite actors to see, you know. But maybe it's like I'm soft to the Nate Bader. Nate Bader. Yes, <laughs> doing that. Like, I just always enjoy him. So just seeing him. Also, mind you, on his IMDb page, everybody has, like, their headshot and everything else. Mm-hmm. Go to Patrick Warburton. It is him as the tick. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great picture. Like, and I'm like, okay, on the one hand, come on. You come gotta, on. Yeah, you, you gotta get a headshot. But on the other hand, I want to keep it. Right. <laughs> like... At least it's not as insulting as uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, the guy that got killed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it just shows his death picture. <laughs> yeah, this is what he's known for. <laughs> yes, exactly. At, at least this is like almost, especially the sculpted muscles here. I mean, forget about it. Again, <laughs> yes. Um, and of course, always got to mention this. And always love my voices. Roger Jackson once again returns as Ghostface, and he's also a person i feel like kills it every single time like yeah, he just he loves voice. doing yes it is a perfect great voice like perfect love you roger jackson keep on keep it on there uh you did perfect mm-hmm. <laughs> did perfect just with the voice and everything um one thing i want to talk about um is the sets which is yeah. rare kind of to talk about sets a lot of the time there mm-hmm. uh but i, I again there is a lot of um, stuff that I do like about the set. Again, it being set in Hollywood there. Mm-hmm. My favorite set scene um, happens to be whenever they go to the uh, Stab 3 production set. Yes. And how trippy that is and how it's laid out like a Hollywood set and everything. I'll probably talk more and gush on about it in uh, spoilers, but that probably for me was my favorite one of my favorite sections of the film that in the finale mm-hmm. whenever it's taking place um at that building essentially yeah. i won't dive into too much spoilers just in case but yeah i was a really big fan and i was like man i love the choice of where they shot the film at essentially there no like, i agree it was... yeah i love that and i love that yeah like when, when sydney's walking through the house and then you know because at some point you you see it zoomed out as a set but then you're mm-hmm. also just like back in the house at other points because it becomes indistinguishable from a film set so it, it, it really i love the play on that i love how it was also playing on sydney's like psychological trauma <clears> or whatever <throat> to like be like i'm back in the house and then seeing different scenes that she experienced in her life mm-hmm. um yeah yeah i mean that's i thought it was not only great narratively but yeah just really really interesting to to look at and to to have you know certain chase scenes and stuff in later so it was, mm. yeah yeah I, I love that set. yeah not only that but just like wandering through the sets in general be it like costume mm-hmm. makeup stuff like that and you know it it could be just me just being extra like generous or allured by it because i do i obviously yes i love movies mm-hmm. and i love the process of making movies so the fact that it's really just honing in on that and everything i'm yeah. like this is awesome. But I like this. This is also a franchise that gets really creative with the chase, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Not just the kill scenes, but mm-hmm. like everything that leads up to it. And all, they have these these really dynamic sets. That I mean, this mm-hmm. one literally being a set, but also all the other places in the movie um, allow for a lot of creativity and running away and fighting back and all these things that have, that are you come to expect from the Scream franchise at this point that they just knock out of the park. Whereas a lot of other horror movies might be like, "This is a really cool set." and then she just dies here or whatever mm-hmm. like, or it's like okay but like no they, they use the set they use the wherever they are you know they, mm-hmm. they use the environment and so putting them in yeah. these really interesting environments that still make sense to the story is like it's like wow that's great horror but. yeah yeah um yeah and it i feel like i can't add too much to that um the kills um I felt like they were for the most part satisfying there mm-hmm. anytime i ever thought like Mm, that was kind of underwhelming. They just sprinkle a little bit of garnish where I'm like, yeah, yeah. ah, Scream 3, yeah. all right. All right, you, you got you, the parsley on it now. Yeah. <laughs> you threw on the Lowry salt. I see what you're doing. Yeah, nice. <laughs> mm, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's fun. Um, you've ruined the Scream franchise in one way. <laughs> 
because now anytime Dewey pops up, I'm talking about the music and yeah. I hear the doom doom <laughs> like the, the cowboy. Yeah, yeah, the cat. I never realized that until you brought it up, and now it just blasts in my ear, sticks out like a sore thumb. I'm like, damn you, Aaron. He is a trope. I mean, so many. I mean, all these characters really, to some extent, are tropes. Gail Weathers mm-hmm. is the fucking no obnoxious reporter girl trope, and like these are mm-hmm. these are, but they're borrowing these and then playing on them in really fun ways. And I love that mm-hmm. Dewey is like, yeah, the cowboy that saves the day or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> when, he's, when he's dopey, he's a dopey guy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, yeah. Um, Trying to think of anything else we could talk about. We're already getting pretty close to the spoiler section. I guess just to sprinkle in lightly, because obviously these films are known for the grand reveal at the end. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about the grand reveal at the end of the film about exactly who the ghost face killer was mm, yeah i feel like um those can be some difficult executions sometimes and this this one i didn't feel poorly about it but it also didn't blow my brains off you know mm. it was one of those things where i was like okay like i'm cool with that um they did set it up properly i don't think it was something that was like yes that was satisfying you know, but mm. it was, but it was like, yeah, that makes sense, and I'll, I'll check that box. So I'm in a sort of unique place where I was like, yeah, that works. Mm. But I wasn't like, ah, oh, the ending, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh, the ending. Yeah, that that really sent it home. Mm-hmm. No, I remember. I'm not going to get into spoilers about it. I remember hating the ending. Really, <laughs> I hated the twist and everything else like that. I was like frustrated and annoyed there. Rewatching it the second time, I was like, you know what? It's okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. That's kind of how I felt about it. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I still love the reveal of the first film more, but I think that just has to do with the fact of how played up it was. I'm yeah. going to keep it very light on spoilers, even though obviously we've already kind of spoiled a bit. Again, it's we're talking about sequels. If you haven't listened to the other right, videos right. and our thoughts, we'll, but that's we'll, we'll that's, save the ending at that, least. That, if that's you beside the point. We'll we'll one. save the yes. We'll, we'll we'll save it there. But I thought it was a lot more palatable essentially there yeah. and so like kind of towards the end i i've i've left this film feeling better than i did on the second one which who knows maybe on the second one it's like you know uh, it's like oh first one too hot too cold maybe it'll be just right for me mm-hmm. i don't know that that depends there um aaron yeah. anything else you do want to discuss about scream three before diving into spoilers man, i'm just excited to get to spoilers so hey, yes I'm, oh I'm man well oh. Not, not that I have, like, no, some no, big no, no, things, no, no, but yeah, I just, no. I like, I like yeah, being yeah. unburdened by that section. You know, be oh, like I... Rock Lee, drop the weights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's time. That's the spoilers. Uh, Aaron, so, yeah. before getting to spoilers, how's about that rating, boss man? Um, yeah, I feel like this, this movie did what all the Scream movies try to do, and I feel like it did it pretty well. I feel like they got the levels honed in on the goofiness, on the, the, the sort of fourth wall meta commentary on movies and scary movies in particular and even move the movies within their own universe without getting too bogged down or complicated i thought the dialogue was actually really fantastically written in this film for the most part um there's definitely some cheesy moments but it's like i think they got the cheese levels right too um yeah there i mean there was some things i feel like this is a two-hour movie it didn't feel that that long necessarily but it did feel like it probably drug on a little more than it needed to. I felt like they introduced a giant cast of characters that was like, meh, because they needed to have that whodunit aspect. And I felt like they did it serviceably well. There's just a little room for improvement in little parts. So, um, but overall, I felt like this was really good. I feel like they hit the vibe. It's not exactly the same Scream 1 vibe, but it's um, it's it's definitely has that fun, playful horror aspect while still being um, uh, surprisingly witty for a film that's overall... Um, you know, kind of corny and cheesy and horror because it doesn't want to lose that aspect. So I feel like they really got the balance right here for me. Um, this is a really solid, like, ah, this is where it gets hard. I'm, I'm between like a seven and an eight on this Whoa. one. I think it's like a seven for me, honestly, if I had to bring it down to one level or another. But it's, um, yeah, I feel like it's a really solid entry to the franchise i think sequels are really tricky and i felt like they found a unique angle with with this one that really you know hits pretty hard so 
damn, this this is um kind of a surprise and everything because I know like obviously I was psyched for the first one and I think at the time you rated Scream a five and everything mm-hmm. at the time there, which I know you've mentioned like now you kind of understand the vibe of Scream, so you're curious yeah. how it is on rewatch and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and the second one. I think I think you're the one like holding me back from tearing this film apart. You're like, okay, dude, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't. Yeah, calm down, calm down. Essentially, that was what that episode was because I remember being kind of annoyed at how much I was aggravated. Uh, but yeah, no, this one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Weird, wild stuff. You know, there. Um, that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, so with me, I. It's hard. It, it's hard for me to quantify where I place this. Do I like this more than Scream 1? Absolutely not. I, I just think, like, again, too much is on Scream 1, just personal attachment-wise for me, mm-hmm. to debunk it with this one. I do love this film more than 2. I do love this film more than 2. Mm-hmm. The question is, because I think 2, I ended up rating, like, a four at the time or five i can't remember it was Mm -hmm. it was pretty lowly and again i could have just been extra pissed and that usually doesn't help with rating stuff you know whenever you got your head in a certain mental funk you're like willing to be more negative or what's my it's my least favorite entry in the franchise so far too so okay i feel you all right yeah well that's good this one is weird where like again it does stuff that's actually like really good like i mentioned where i was like oh man this is so cool they did this there Mm -hmm. essentially but then there's also like so stupid stuff that pushes itself beyond the boundaries of stupidity Mm -hmm. to just being like it's like the room how it's just like so bad it's good essentially right it has such stupid scenes that pushes the limits to where it's like that was perfect (laughs) like because there's one scene in particular where like already the result of it was stupidly fantastic but with how much they just kept rolling in on Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. it just was stupidly brilliant like it just pushed the limits and i'm sure we could talk more about the spoilers oh lordy ratings wise ebb i think yeah yeah Mm -hmm. trying to think i it's so difficult for me I think I'm going to come at this with a cool, cool 7. Like, Ah. I thought about 6.5, but I'm like, I'm just going to sprinkle some generosity, some apology flakes. I'm sorry I was hard (laughs) on you. Back in the day, I badmouthed you for over a decade. (laughs) I will um, make amends for it the rest of my life, essentially. Because looking at this film, like, there's definitely some stuff where I'm like, okay that 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 wasn't (laughs) stupidly brilliant that was just stupid you know there but really there's just a lot of good to be seen and had with this film and Mm -hmm. in all honesty like if this had been the end of the scream franchise i would have been like okay that's that's a solid batch solid Mm -hmm. batch of films i'm watching you two (laughs) um (laughs) solid batch of films there essentially um (laughs) but yeah so how about that? Yeah. We're big friends of uh, Scream 3, so the franchise can still live on in the podcast. Another double sevens. <laughs> yes, double sevens. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing rolling I dice. I <laughs> we need a third person here to get the lucky triple sevens. I, I know. Yeah, the last the time jackpot. we got triple sevens, I think, was Texas yeah. Chainsaw Massacre 2. Dave, yeah. yeah, so anyways... How about we just slash into some uh, spoilers? Yeah, so, Aaron, I know you're excited to really dive in. What do you want to talk about first? Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about we just how about we just take it from the beginning? Yeah. And then we just kind of work our way through because yeah, there they were did, they did another like cold <clears throat> open kind of dealio where they uh, not 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 like literally cold open, but they had, had followed a character that then died pretty quickly. Yeah, which I do like that trope there. Mm. I, I I I will say this: the 
I always love that the opening of the uh, Scream films has been kind of like an open closed short film essentially right. there. Yeah, yeah. Like the first one with Drew Barrymore, mm -hmm. the second Iconic. one with uh, Jaded Pinkett uh, Smith. Mm -hmm. and... I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. no, no, it, it was it, in the it's theater, a movie right? theater. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, I do, I do. That one, and then this one has uh, Cotton Weary mm -hmm. back in the frame again, played by Lee Schreiber, which, mm -hmm. you know, we barely saw him in the first film because mm -hmm. he was like supposedly the person that killed Sydney's mom. Right. The second one is him just be like, hey, Sydney, I need you to sign up on this whenever he was potentially one of the suspects there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's him heading home and I him breaking out the cell phone and... It, it it doubles down on the fact that like they tried to make him a sympathetic character like oh he's wrongly framed uh -huh. but in the second one it shows he's a piece of shit right, and then right. this one he's like yep still a piece of shit essentially right. yeah he's a fun first kill because he's like a character you know but he's also kind of slimy and they kind of make him kind of slimy in this scene too even where he's like kind of trying to cheat on his girlfriend <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but that but they also they do a good job of setting up sort of the unique aspect of the new power or whatever not really new but the, mm -hmm. the newish power of, of Ghostface and this one where he can emulate all of these survivors voices or whatever mm -hmm. and uses that to sort of manipulate them mm -hmm. yeah that's the thing i will say that i've always appreciated about the attention to detail they're always upping up the thing it mm -hmm. doesn't as much as i love friday the 13th it is pretty much tr true yes yeah. <laughs> it's jason in the woods no technology if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it there. Right. Might spice it up with some new stuff there, essentially. But this one, they're constantly elevating the power. Just the fact of, like, you know, they're really focusing on, like, you know, oh, can you check caller ID? Mm -hmm. Oh, can you dial back this phone number? Stuff like that, which I can appreciate. And, right. again, like, Ghostface being, like, you know, obviously they're, they have the classic Ghostface default voice you could use. Mm -hmm. But now they're just pretending to be other people as well. And... While I will say maybe this is my least favorite cold open out of the three, yeah. it's still solid. It is. And I feel like it does make sense, again, uh, for the killer's uh, motive, essentially, to target Cotton, essentially. It does. Who yeah, has yeah. been basically riding off the high of Sydney's mom's murder, just being a person that was wrongly accused, and now he's able to make it big in Hollywood, essentially. Right. And also, yeah, mm -hmm. I love how they set up how the, the, the killer is following the script, because, he, you know, Cotton's having these conversations about how he's supposed to be doing a cameo in this film, and he's going to be the first one that dies, or whatever. Right. And then and then he dies. And then, and mm -hmm. then yeah, we go... We go in sequentially after that uh, for, yeah for a certain amount of time yeah and it does make it more interesting because like whenever uh the girlfriend christine is being attacked in the home there mm -hmm. uh the ghost face is using um the voice of cotton right. to try to trick her as if like oh he's dressing up as ghost face mm -hmm. and basically trying to stab her freaking her out so that way whenever cotton inevitably gets there they're too busy like having a whodunit like you know Right, like he's trying to convince her that he's not trying to kill her; he's there to protect her, and then yeah. that ends up getting them both killed. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so I feel like it works pretty good, essentially. Um, but like, it's it's still a perfectly fine cold open. Like, it mm -hmm. didn't feel like it was bad by any means. No. It's just unfortunate between the three; it's the weakest one. It is. It does mm -hmm. a lot as far as like connecting the dots and setting things up or whatever. It does, mm -hmm. but it's just not as um, yeah. like dynamic and dramatic and flashy as those other two were. I mean, you can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, that fr the first one with Drew Barrymore is yeah, is iconic. Yes. The second one is like a perfect introduction to how like meta this series is gonna get. As, mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, this one it's it's kind of hard to top those two but i think it does a good job yeah i feel like it does fine and again uh probably just helps like you know add a conclusive end to cotton yeah, essentially yeah, yeah. there who didn't really have too much to write off of because mm -hmm. literally all his characterization was really brought into since one was just a name essentially right. Right. uh but i feel like overall it was it's fine it's fine uh as it opened there um, and whenever we get to the, um, next person that dies, I believe that is the, uh, character Sarah who mm -hmm. dies essentially because yes. basically the, um, director, uh, Roman calls her up and says like, Hey, I really need to go over some lines with you. Meet me at the studio as we try to work it out. And she's like, okay, yeah, whatever. And so she goes there or whatever and, um, is in the office, um, which I, I, 
I hate and I love the stupid gag effect that was done with like mm-hmm. one of the actors acting like he had a pair of scissors skiz- like <laughs> sliced through his head there. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, they have like the joke of like, you know, oh yeah, it's a makeup dude. He does a good job. And then the guy's like, thank you very much. You know, like Elvis <laughs> yeah. as he has an Elvis skeleton shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> Weird stuff like that. Um, but yeah, she does have that great line about like, you know, oh, you know, me getting killed in the shower. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, how original. Hello, they did that in Vertigo. Right. <laughs> even though it's obviously Psycho. I'll watch the episode. Mm. Um, and I I do like that, essentially. Again, I always love the setup that Ghostface has, like, you know, kind of stalking in on it, prey, as it were, there. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's a chase. And I think that's kind of, like, the unique thing about it there mm-hmm. is the fact that he'll taunt you from a distance and he's closing in without you realizing it essentially but them going over script lines again very hollywood move essentially i feel like ends up being a nice setup there um i also love the small touch of her accidentally breaking the uh, award statue Mm -hmm. in the uh, director's office there and the little head coming off or whatever yeah yeah I, i thought that was um fun especially for the joke they make later about it there essentially right but whenever they're going over it, uh, then the uh, chase uh, starts to continue. And this is like the brilliance of like a lot of the chase scene set up that you can already see immediately with Sarah. Is the fact that, you know, she starts basically um, running as soon as she senses trouble. And she hides in a clothing rack, essentially. <laughs> That's just full of ghost face <clears throat> costumes. <laughs> Which makes sense, because they're on the set of Stab, essentially. Right, right. And so, again, like him just stepping off the... Um, clothes rack there and stepping down is a great reveal essentially Mm -hmm. to him being there and um as the set continues on like the thing i love is that she's hiding on the clothes rack and you think okay she's going to run away no Ghostface is just going to grab the clothes rack and push it with all his might to launch her out of there and Mm -hmm. i'm like you didn't have to go the extra mile but by golly gosh you did you could have just had her run but nope you're like we're shoving her through and everything right and then as she tries to uh, get out, ends up flying through, like, part of the glass door as mm-hmm. she gets stabbed in the back. So, a little bit of a clima- uh, anticlimactic end, but, you know, that's how Ghostface does. Like, usually right. finishes with a stab. Right. You know, it's like the little, like, mascarpato cherry on top there. <laughs> right, that's yeah. his signature. He's got a stab. He's, yes. He's a stabber. <laughs> Anyways, I start to stab it. <laughs> um, but I just, like, setting up stuff like that, like the... Cl- uh, costume rack there essentially i was like okay that's fun mm-hmm. essentially um yeah and then the third one what i do love is the f- <laughs> lordy the third deaths is whenever they start looking at it the uh actress who is trying to play uh gail weathers in the stab movies mm-hmm. starts uh freaking out because she's like you know I'm the next person that's supposed to die right. essentially there and they're like wait so the person's going off with the script and they're like well, maybe right. there's been drafts to the film and mm-hmm. the, the kill there's order's like, been different. There's three different scripts floating out there, so who's going to be next? Yeah, because yeah, they mentioned, like, you know, scripts get leaked online all the time and everything, so mm-hmm. it could be just a wannabe right. wanting to come in. And I like that aspect. I think that uh, honestly speaks levels. Like, yeah, that stuff happens all the time, and it's a good um, line of thought there, essentially. And so, basically... Uh, she's freaking out about uh potentially being the one that's killed Mm -hmm. next uh basically parker posey uh who plays the character of uh gail weathers for the stab film but her actual name is jennifer jolie Mm -hmm. go figure um is freaking out about it we get introduced to the god legend patrick warburton playing (laughs) uh stephen stone right guard yeah he's he's like don't worry uh do drop (laughs) (laughs) i got this cover yeah he he has such little screen time but it's just great like because he's just fully confident he Mm -hmm. is he is fully patrick warburton in the role just playing it straight Mm -hmm. um so it's fun seeing that stuff uh, going on there, essentially. But, yeah, I like whenever they're panicking about it. Like, Stephen Stone is not very trusting of, like, Dewey there. And is just trying to look through. He's like, I'm wondering if maybe you're the killer. Yeah. <laughs> this is the only time I think we'll ever be able to talk about Patrick Warburton on this podcast. I don't think he was in a lot of horror a films. opportunity. Yeah. And he's just like, 
Yeah, I'm just looking through your trailer right now. <laughs> and and then um, I I love that whenever it's revealed, like, oh, he's not actually talking to Dewey on the phone. It's Ghostface. Ghostface is in a trailer. He stabs him, and Patrick Warburton immediately is like choking him, right? Like absolutely choking him out. He does just like take it. <laughs> he takes the stab immediately. Yeah, he just like he just immediately like he gets stabbed. He's like, I'm gonna kill you. you know, yeah. Going in for it, and then. Fortunately, he's able to get a kick off, which kicks the knife deeper mm-hmm. in there. And he manages to hit him with a fry pad repeatedly, which I love oh, that yeah. he, he has the Patrick Warburton scream, which sounds like Joe anytime he's mm. screaming at Family Guy. So it was just instantaneously funny. <laughs> and so you're just like, okay. I love he hit him with a double slap, too. I feel like yes. the, the movie is like just, they, are, they know getting hit with a frying pan is goofy. And they're like, you know what would be kind of goofy? <laughs> If you get it with a frying pan twice, <laughs> <laughs> double down, Bing, double down, yeah, double. Slap. Um, it hit twice. And so, and you think that's the end of Patrick Warburton? No, you see like the door that's open, and of course, like Dewey, Gale, and the rest of the actor gang is freaking out essentially there. Mm-hmm. And as the front door opens and the power like starts like flickering a little bit there, you see Patrick Warburton walking up, bleeding to do one last. Uh, <laughs> fall essentially right. there to freak him and the next thing that ends up happening is that uh ghostface starts talking to them through facts right, right faxing over a script there essentially and um that was goofy and mm-hmm. i'm like okay i'm guessing he has a laptop or something like that that's that's my only guess as to um what's going on mm-hmm. here because basically they start getting this um facts coming through and everything else and it says like it's talking through the uh stab movie essentially mm-hmm. there just kind of uh letting you know what's going on and they're just slowly waiting for it like oh, what's it saying what's it saying what's the next page what's the next page right. and it essentially goes face is sending like a script saying like you know only one of them will be shown mercy mm-hmm. <laughs> essentially um doing that <laughs> silly silly moment there essentially and they're, yeah and they're, they keep yelling as to whether or not they need to be inside or outside which one's safer they're like, no the killer wants us outside no he wants us inside yeah. and so yeah I, I love how finally dewey was like everybody outside except for the actor that plays dewey <laughs> the, like the the actor that plays dewey in the stab yes films. i i literally had to look it up uh the character's name's tom prince played by matt Kieslar. Yeah, because he's like, oh, I'm going to be the one to go inside there. Because right, he's like, the killer's only giving mercy to one person or whatever. And he's like trying to read because the lights are all off. And he whips out the lighter and he reads the page with the lighter. He's like, the one who smells the gas. And then <laughs> <laughs> that explosion. Yeah, it's the most ridiculous explosion of all. The entire house, the roof comes off. <laughs> and it blows like all th- like four of the other characters off the railing and they fall yeah. forever down the who hill are, who are already like on the other side of the pool like a like a pool and patios distance away from the explosion but it just knocks them all back rolling down that hill and i just love it because they amped up the explosion yeah. like multiple explosions happened all at once there and they really focused in you even see uh Matt Kessler's character just get obliterated Terminator yeah. style just <laughs> doing that and it is like the biggest Hollywood Michael Bay freaking explosion and because they focus on it for so long it just pushes the absurdity to where it's like yeah that's great yeah, that's yeah, good yeah. um ends up being super funny there and then of course um Ghostface tries to uh stab the real Gale mm-hmm. and not the stand-in Gale um, but of course, like the thing that gets me is like Dewey, uh, shoots Ghostface, but gets away there, you mm-hmm. know, happens, which may add a little bit of like a problem I have towards the latter half of the film. But one thing that's unique about this Ghostface killer is that they've been leaving photos behind of Sydney's mother, which again, oh lordy, let's talk about Sydney's mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I kind of forgot what was up with that in the first like movie. Or, did she mention yeah. it in the second movie? Yeah. Or... Uh, vaguely because we're going to be spoiling the first two films mind you like there is no escape from spoilers for the first two so if you don't want to be spoiled i'm sorry like i don't know why you're watching the third one without seeing the other ones but that's on you yes (laughs) yes your fault um (laughs) no but basically like because in the first film it's just like a name only there essentially the Mm. second one it's kind of brought up more because the ghost face killer in the second one is billy loomis's mom 
and some other person I can't remember who it was because I think <laughs> I blocked that out from anger. Um, but basically, they really start hammering in like the mom aspect and where Sydney's like seeing like a ghost visage of her yeah, yeah. approaching, and it's it's really goofy. It is. It's really goofy and cheesy, and I don't think it works as it should. Like this is the one part where I'm like, I don't think they intended this on being cheesy. No, I don't think they did either. I think they were supposed to, I think they were trying to amp up, yeah, like that psychological trauma aspect of her and like trying to find out the answers for her mother or whatever. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know how much the audience cared about it, but I I thought that was kind of the weaker aspect. I get it. But at the same point, that's one of the things where I'm like, every time it pops up, I'm like, okay, this is going to be dumb (laughs) essentially so i just like brace for it then it's over like again i like the idea about like sydney being haunted by Mm -hmm. her mother's death but at the same point i feel like why is she now being haunted by it instead of just being haunted by ghost face but right that would be the more traumatic thing you would think (laughs) yeah for sure but i'm i don't know who knows with this film but because they try to set up like a earlier thing at whenever sydney's like dreaming or whatever and her mom's like at the window tapping and then oh it's ghost face like i like that transition reveal like you know her mom and ghost face are kind of one and the same but Mm -hmm. i just felt like it was just kind of week overall and it kind of yeah. took away from the film and i'm like i don't really i'm not buying into this there essentially but leaving the photos behind it is kind of curious like were you catching on as to why maybe the killer was leaving photos behind um i mean i knew the movie was trying to trail some things on i don't think i really got <laughs> it until they made the connection in the movie where they were like it, she was in this this studio or whatever and they're like oh yeah yeah that that's how i feel about it as well essentially there where i'm just sort of like eh about it overall um good lord i'm trying to um think about it yeah and it's like by this point this is like the death that finally makes sydney come out of hiding i'm pretty sure there essentially where she'll come down to the studio because the detective's like look we need to make sure she's kept safe and Sydney probably could help us with the investigation, like maybe, because this is very tied closely to you guys and Woodsboro, essentially. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, and she gets the phone call from Ghostface, and so they right. That was also. I feel like both those things are meant to like throw some heat on the detective. You know what I mean? mm Because he was the one that borrowed Dewey's phone, and Dewey's phone is one of the few phones that has Sydney's contact or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they were like, oh you and one other person like had access yeah. to this and then yeah the, and then uh so that threw some heat on the detective and then the fact that the tech was like we really need sydney to be here to question her they're like why do you want her here you know? yeah that's kind of the interesting thing because the newest technology they mentioned in this film is that you can clone cell phones essentially yeah. like i don't know how realistic that is because i've never looked into that venture but mm-hmm obviously by this point i'm sure it probably exists but like back in 2000 i don't know but that's a technology that's currently going around Mm -hmm. there um but yeah so uh that and i do like the fact that that's the other thing that draws sydney out of hiding is like well now ghostface knows where i'm at Mm -hmm. now i have to get involved essentially because i'm safer around other people but also Mm -hmm. we need to shut this shit down yeah and really another kill doesn't happen for a long time but it does lead to like again probably my favorite chase in the film and just a really good one overall is whenever they decide to go to the studio because they notice with the photo that was dropped uh whenever um gail was about to be attacked by ghostface at uh the pool house Mm -hmm. um that hey this is the studio lot what in the world is she doing at a studio lot like why was she here because they add the context of like oh well uh sydney's mom actually left for two years right and nobody knew where she was yeah and then came back there essentially um but leading up to it uh before my favorite part i guess there is one thing i forgot that i don't know how to feel about it but i also love that they threw it in the film Mm -hmm. is the fact that randy's sister's in the film yeah 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 Yeah. and and she's the one that's like uh what does she even give them oh the The, tape yeah the The tape tape from randy yeah 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 Yeah, which was i i do like how that that was probably the most meta part of all of it yes but it did i don't know sort of set up some some like 
structure and expectations for the audience going forward. And he's like, if it's if you're in a trilogy, then <laughs> that's like you might not be in a third film. You might be in a trilogy that ends the whole thing. And so like I feel like that that was a fun point to realize in the movie if you were mm-hmm. in, in the audiences in those days too to be like, oh, this is the end of the mm-hmm. screen franchise. And it, it's like one of those things where it almost feels like okay, we're really pushing for this, but a with the absurdity that the screen franchise has, and mm-hmm. two, Randy as a character, I believe would record something like yeah this. yeah randy would be the one to do that yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I believe he's always thinking ahead about that sort of stuff there and he's and movie pilled and he was movie pilled in the other movies yeah yes exactly and it's just also fun it's a fun way to round off the trilogy there like okay how do we bring uh uh jamie kennedy back to reprise his role as randy even though we killed him in the second one yeah yeah he recorded a video cassette tape there <laughs> right. which i just i i thought it was funny and i do i it's so dumb and cheesy at the it beginning is. part of like um, him mentioning like hooking up with that one girl at the video rental store. And they're like, ooh, her. He's like, yes, yes her. <laughs> he's like, shut up. <laughs> Doing, like, it's just so stupid, it but is. also I love it and buy it. Right. I'm like, yes, you may pass. I love this portion. So that was like a fun callback where I'm like, good on you, Scream. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. I, I like that a ton. I, I think moments like that are, are important, honestly, because it just shows that the mm-hmm. film doesn't take itself that seriously, you know. But yeah, which, which you need for something that's gonna mm-hmm. pull off this level of goof. But yeah, and I guess like I, I really want to talk about that favorite section of the scene, but there mm-hmm. is one other thing I'll throw in. It's whenever uh, Gail Weathers is trying to investigate the studio, mm-hmm. and she has um, the character Jennifer right behind her where she's right. like i am gail weathers this is how i would be gail is, weathers right she's like trying to method act <laughs> yes and i love that and i love how much she's like bitching and complaining about like mm, well my gail weathers wouldn't be like this right. my gail mm-hmm. weathers like, like and then <laughs> at look, one point Dirt dewey and her are both just like shut up <laughs> yeah which i would believe that because actors can't be so pretentious and they're like i think i know my character better than yourself right, essentially right. like you know they're just that deep in it there mm-hmm. but i do love that whenever they go down to the film archives i even just like made a joke because i had completely forgot with like this like guard that's down there i'm like is that carrie fisher because mm-hmm. she's just sitting there with a cigarette and then she just made a joke she's like are you no mm-hmm. i get it a lot yeah she was like i almost got the part of leia or something <laughs> She she said she says something to that effect. She was like, "I was this close to being cast as Leia." <laughs> yeah, they're like, but Carrie decided to uh, sleep with George Lucas. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's just like a fun little gag cutaway there, and they talk about like the fact that she's like, "Yeah, I recognize this person." She went under a different stage name essentially mm-hmm. there, and they're like, "Who would do that?" And then. Um, uh, Carrie throws the sweet diss about like yeah I wouldn't be talking about like Gertie or right, something right. like that towards uh, Jennifer um, and that ends up being like a little fun part of like that was fun mm-hmm. and like cool that they got Carrie Fisher for that part there so yeah. the cameos like I said they sprinkle in and they don't detract too too much there Yeah, I feel like they blend in perfectly with the universe there while also making Wink Wink Nudge Nudge sort of like the uh, Matt Pat cameo in Five Nights at Freddy's <laughs> right right <laughs> still love that cameo (laughs) anyway uh, beside the point now we can finally talk about what i consider to be one of my favorite sections is the fact that whenever um sydney's going to the studio or whatever she's trying to use the restroom and then she sees like a pair of black boots and a dress there essentially and whenever she i i love that sydney again is not afraid she's like i swear to god this is ghost face and she has like the pepper spray because you know she's not going to be pecking heat 24 7 especially on a studio lot yeah breaks it out and then uh instead of it being ghost face it's uh actually uh angelia tyler uh mm-hmm. tyler who's playing sydney in the film and she drops the mask there and is like you know oh sorry since they canceled the production of uh stab three um i felt like i just needed to take away some of his stuff there essentially Mm -hmm. um and that's like okay yeah and then of course she drops the brush and then that's what leads sydney to be drawn to the set of woodsboro which again is probably pretty traumatic because like it's set up exactly where um a lot of the like um murders happen there essentially so all of it's in her childhood home Yeah, yeah yeah She like walks into mm-hmm. her room, and then there's then then there's another version of her room after the murder. You know, there's there's so there's just like bl- there's like her room, and then her room covered in blood. Yes, exactly. And I do love that whenever she's walking up to her room, she looks and she sees how the doors 
uh, are exactly the way they were in the first one. Because remember, mm. they made a joke like, you always need to close your closet door. It always gets stuck. And she purposefully sticks it once again. Right. And thinking, you know, it's going to come through the door because that's what happened in the first film. Mm. But no, Ghostface comes through. The window grabs her and pulls her back there, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they begin this, like, great staircase scene. Because then... It mimics in the first film whenever she runs up the staircase. The first time I think Ghostface actually chases her up that spiral staircase there. Mm -hmm. And as she's running up, she's like, oh, I'll run to this room. But you just forgot the fact that this is a set. They're right. not going to have it built fully as a house. And so then she goes to nothing there, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so then um, that was another thing I did love. Her running up the stairs, there was so much more crap laid out so she's like throwing a vase at him pushes mm -hmm. like a whole book rack down the stairs mm -hmm. essentially like Ghostface has a lot of crap being thrown uh, their way and then once Ghostface is like oh I know you went in this room uh, but obviously as it's revealed later Ghostface knows the set inside out so he mm -hmm. knows he's not going to fall through but what he's not expecting is Sydney to be there to pull Ghostface yeah, out grab him and throw him out yeah. yeah throw him on the bed there essentially but ends up being um a fun chase although that's unfortunately the part where like sydney starts hearing like the voice which i'm guessing because it's revealed later that ghostface is able to do the voice of the mother at some areas yeah, but is yeah. able to do it specifically and so i guess he's like luring her towards like the murder bedroom scene there again mm -hmm. where uh once again i think ghostface tries to uh attack attack her again but she's able to escape yeah, there he's like hidden under mm -hmm. like the sheet or whatever that's supposed yes to and then he rises up and the sheet's all draped over him he's like it's your mother or whatever and then she like yeah basically freaks out and jumps out the window there mm -hmm. and then that's whenever the crew starts running in there and of course they're not able to take her word too much because they're like you're seeing things you're just horribly traumatized right. and, and police seeing... run up there and they're like there's no one here yeah and they're like S -s you know, like, I'm so sorry you had to see that, you know, that we were setting up, like, the initial, like, first murder mm -hmm. that happened with your mom there. I'm so sorry to probably traumatize you. She's like, no, no, I saw him. I saw him right then and there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I loved about that is that it was just, the reason why I love it is that it's a great chase scene for multiple reasons because of several callbacks to the first film mm -hmm. like oh this is exactly like the same scene as it was before and then two it's almost sort of like sort of like wonderland kind of setting up like it feels like a home but because it's a set it feels just very dystopian yeah offset off kilter there with some of the angles and stuff they're able to do but it also fits in perfectly with like the like built stage thing i just mm. feel like it worked really well overall and i was like oh, wow i'm yeah. really really enjoying this there um one character we haven't really gotten to talk too much about surprisingly i know we've talked about a little bit is um the director of stab three roman bridger played Whoa, by man. scott foley there and again he has about as much like screen time as like the other people do mm -hmm. he's just like very bitchy and complaining he's like yeah. i want to direct a romantic film not a horror film mm -hmm. he's like i'm only trying to do this so i could get my film made there essentially um and i never know how to feel about him because he was always just bitching and moaning the entire time yeah yeah he's like i'm gonna be 30 and i'm not gonna have my film made or whatever yeah um so it was just interesting seeing him pop up again and again i never knew how to feel about him i did love that one line um where he feels like he's going to be the person that's next killed there and he pulls up the trophy he's like don't you think this is a sign right, right. you know uh having that going on there mm -hmm. i just felt like i needed to mention him because again yeah. i've mentioned the other characters i'm like i haven't really mentioned the director and i, at and I all. thought it was interesting mm -hmm. they tried to like throw some heat away from roman because he like is actually the only one that gets interviewed by the police as a suspect or something and then they just don't really talk about him anymore because mm -hmm. they were like you had his number or you had would have had sydney's number so let's go interrogate you or whatever no it's because it's because roman called sarah before he killed her or whatever <clears throat> yes but then they found out it was from a clone cell phone or whatever yeah um and so it's at that point where basically they're having sydney stay at the uh, station there essentially because it's like you know okay like even if you were attacked it's still probably a good idea that you just lay low here essentially right 
um, and basically Detective Kincaid is there, and you know, he's also seen as a suspect because he loves films. You mm-hmm. see like lots of like how to make films on his desk there, and that's one of the things about Ghostface is that they always tend to like the movies. Quite a cinema file. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's throwing up that. But then they have like the interesting revelation once they found out the uh, IMDb listing, as it was for Sydney's mom, mm-hmm. that they're like, oh my God, the producer of the three films she was a part of is the same guy who's producing the Stab films yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And so they go to interrogate him. And they do have, like, that throwaway line where, like, Roman, once again, is bitching and complaining. Right, right. Go figure. And uh, he's like, well, hey, how about you go to my mansion for your birthday? Mm-hmm. How about that, you know? And they're like, oh, happy birthday, Roman, doing that. All right. And then as they interrogate um, Milton or whatever, that's just like, it was the 70s. It was a different time. Right. <laughs> the amount of orgies we had was ridiculous. Yeah, I didn't expect the, like coerced rape subplot yeah that was weird that was weird not gonna lie i was just like wow they just kind of dropped in and casually now like, hey, if you wanted to make it in this film you know and he's like and the girls that came there they invited it one way or another and i was like oh wow this is literally and then when i saw harvey weinstein produced this in the credits i was like oh that makes sense yeah <laughs> they were warning us <laughs> Like I can't believe Harvey Weinstein was like, "Yep, let will sign this off. This is <laughs> this, this, this character at all. This character looks just like me." Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that definitely is a weird subtext plot, but again, I understand it. At the same point, I'm like, mm, I don't know. I'm I'm just glad it's just sort of like. <sighs> Yeah. I don't know. They don't go into it as, like, it's not yeah. as big slap of a face as it is no, Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street 3, where <laughs> they really are like, okay, Jesus, right. could you could you not? This one is just like, oh, it's a different time, you know. I can't be responsible for what happens to someone at those parties mm-hmm. there, essentially. Um, but it is, like, sort of interesting. You're like, okay, so that happened there. Yeah, it does give motivation mm-hmm. for why that character was, like, covering something up. And it also is like, oh, this is a bad dude. Maybe he's the killer. Yes, but, yeah. exactly. Makes himself another red herring. And then they get to Milton's mansion. And, again, it's only brought up because uh, Dewey gets a call from Sydney, basically saying, hey, I'm heading to Milton's mansion and stuff. And, and Dewey's like, I don't think that's a good idea. It's like, no, no, Ken Kate's with me. It's fine. It's fine. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I really don't think it's a good idea. I'll see you there. Bye. And it's like okay, I guess we're heading to the mansion there. Mm. And so they end up being there as well as uh, the director and uh, three of the uh, castmates there, mm-hmm. essentially. And I love this mansion, dude. Oh, this yeah. mansion is a Scooby-Doo-ass looking mansion. Yeah, I, love I am it. all for it. And it's like, yeah, because he's like a Hollywood horror producer guy and he's got trap doors and shit. Like, yeah, it's it's a neat setting. Yeah, I, I really like it a ton. I'm still always going to be forever attached to the first film with, like, the house. I love how that house looks. Mm-hmm. Apparently, you could actually go visit it. Oh, for real? In Cal- I know, in California. How about that? Wow. Just put that on the bucket list. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, beside the point there. Um, yeah, and I just love how grandiose, spooky, and, again, mm-hmm. the sort of, like, secret doors and everything they have yeah. through there and everything. And I love how even Roman says, like, yeah, yeah, they, I, I think they probably have one of those screening rooms. It was really popular in the '70s, where mm-hmm. they do like drinks, drugs, you know, all that sort of stuff there, mm-hmm. essentially, just to get away with it. And then Roman's like, "Yeah, how about we go try to look around for it?" And it's like, "Oh, don't go by yourself. It's dangerous." It's like, okay, we'll go in pairs, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so then they start, uh, div- let's split up, gang, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Always a good idea. Um. And the weird thing is, is like by this point in the film, I I had already known, I, I knew who the killer was from the start of the film right, because right. I remembered exactly who the killer was. Mm-hmm. And two, I had forgotten who the killer was. And as you could tell, I had forgotten half of who the killer was <laughs> in two. Yeah. Um, but it was definitely interesting watching it, knowing who the killer was perspective wise and how it would affect it. And maybe we'll talk about it more mm-hmm. once we talk about who the killer is. I guess we're just going in chronological order by this so. point in yeah, time. We're almost there. Um, but. Again, I like them exploring the mansion. Like, they go down to the basement where there's a lot of, like, movie props there. And, again, mm-hmm. there's a stab costume, right. which makes sense. Of you course. know, Yeah, like a little takeaway there. Um, and then whenever it looks up, uh, Roman's looking at a coffin and sees uh, 
a body in there like a prop and then it's just like silent as the uh character who went with them i believe it was the one that jennifer or whoever played gail yes yeah. gail yes uh duh, 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 duh. um jennifer jolie yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay I am sorry, Jennifer Jolie. I, 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 it, I love that it's the Jennifer movie. Jolie because she plays you know, Jennifer Aniston. Or like, you know, Jennifer Aniston and Angelina Jolie mashup. They're like, this is an actress. This is oh me. my god. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, bro. That is so true. And I love that they did that too. Because I think, what, at this point was was Monica Cox on Friends in 2001? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Courtney Cox. Courtney Cox, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm mixing yeah, up Cor names now. Yes, yes. Her name's Monica in the show, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, um, I'm, that going on. Yeah, I think because Friends started in like 97, I want to say, or something like that maybe i don't yeah. know so i love that I, they just, I, I don't know oh oh fuck 94 yeah okay. Oh, damn. <laughs> okay yeah um yeah so she had been on there for a while there to probably towards the height of the popularity mm -hmm. but the split up goes perfectly fine you know um again it's like pretty loose because it focuses mostly like on them at first and then you don't know what happens to roman and mm -hmm. then whenever uh gail and dewey are searching I think that's at the point where uh, uh, Gail goes downstairs and then opens the coffin and sees that Roman's dead with right. the knife in the chest and everything else. Did you find it odd at that point in time that it didn't show Ghostface killing Roman? I think so. I remember thinking whenever they opened that that I was like, oh, yeah, in like the studio makeup room, this guy, I was like, that could be fake. Like I remember being mm -hmm. like, that could be that. He could be fake. I was also thinking that the girl that played, um, God, the, uh, the main character, Sydney, um, uh, the, the, the actress the, that played Sydney in the stab movies, uh, yes. Angelina Tyler played, yeah, like, yeah. cause she was so weird and freaky and had the ghost. Yeah. Like, that was sort of like a big red, red herring character that they wanted you to think. So at the time I was like, is it still her or whatever? Cause she's off in another pair somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause the whole idea is like, how did you make the leading role in this film there? Like, this is weird. Right. And she's, mm -hmm. yeah. Whenever she's caught in the bathroom with Sydney, she has all the stab gear and then, you know, Sydney's trying to run and give her her hairbrush and then and interacts with Ghostface. So it's like, okay, it's very plausible that this mm -hmm. could be her. So at that time, I thought, I was like, maybe it's both of them. Because I thought, I mean, obviously this this franchise is cool with two killers. So yeah. I was like, maybe it's both of them. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do love that, like, you know, whenever Gail discovers that Roman has been killed mm -hmm. uh, in the coffin, that she runs into her uh, Gail counterpart, as it were. Right. Essentially, and freaking out. It says, like, is he dead? He's like, yes, he's dead. Right. Let's, let's <laughs> well, go. Let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. yeah. And then as we're getting out... <laughs> Um, the uh, Sydney counterpart mm -hmm. pops out and says like, oh, hey, this mansion's wacky, isn't right. it? And it's like, we need to leave right now. There's a killer in here. And she's like, what? What do you mean? It's like Roman says. She's like, fuck you guys. Fuck everything. Mm -hmm. I am not going to die for some pig I fucked, essentially. Right. She's uh, like, I didn't have sex with that pig, What? whatever the Milton, main, Milton. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Milton for this or whatever and runs off. Yeah, and I love how, like, she just turns it to the biggest piece of shit right then and there. Just right. like, fuck you guys, I'm out of here. Right. And then as she runs, uh, lo and behold, uh, Ghostface stabs her. Which I love, the one thing I love about Ghostface is that he's not always brandishing a knife. He just sometimes just punches you. Just straight right. sucker punches. And uh, I love that whenever they uh, end up killing um, Sydney's counterpart there, like both uh, Gales look over the railing. I'm just going to call them counterparts at this point. Yeah, I'm yeah, tired yeah. of consulting yeah. IMDb. And the body is just dragged away by Ghostface. Mm -hmm. And both Gales just start screaming hysterically. <laughs> and I'm like, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's great. And so then they're like running to the bedroom where Dewey's uh, at where he also ran into the uh, uh, Randy counterpart mm -hmm. there where he's and I love like as soon as he's scared he's like fisticuffs he's like ready to like throw down right, essentially right. there and he's like oh you scared me man yeah <laughs> doing that but then they all um, I'm trying to remember again it's like 
like everything is like cranking up to 11 it about does. how it, yeah. ghost face ends up finding him I, I think he's just down the hallway and he just starts chasing after all of them essentially yeah because i remember they all get back together at some point and they're like we'll be safe if we're together right and then ghost face just jumps in and, and like decks randy right? yes that's what happened yeah he just I, does that i love that because i because that is a big trope to, like because they're because yeah normally mm. these killers are only killing when they're separate so i love that they're like we're safe if we're together mm. right and, and dewey's like of course and then immediately goes <laughs> yeah it's so it, good and kills one of them dynamic yeah. entry right. and everything uh and then that's whenever they start scattering essentially mm-hmm. um because basically the gale counterpart tries running and hiding but then ends up you know scooby doing her way through a secret <laughs> passage yes, yes and gets behind a two-way glass which is which if you think about it now yeah why is there two-way glass in that bedroom <laughs> I, I, bro i wasn't even thinking about that but that makes so much goddamn it's sense. the rape room yes oh my god <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but i i i will say it did take a while for it to be like you know okay they're behind the glass it's like what's that mm-hmm. the glass is shaking right because it's like weird. soundproofed or whatever and she's like banging on the glass yeah, yeah. and i do love that like the ghost face is just relishing in her panicking mm-hmm I feel super bad, but I think didn't the Randy counterpart die like on the way of finding her because yeah, he got Ghost, stabbed and pushed like, out a window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghostface kills him, and then yeah, goes back for the rest of them that have scattered. Yeah, doing that. But I love that Dewey shoots the glass one by one to where it's like the final one, mm-hmm. and then it shows that the Gale counterpart has finally been dead. So we don't have to make this any more complicated right. than what it needs to All be. All the counterparts are dead now. All the counterparts are dead. They are off the table. They are essentially. Whew. And so what I do love is um, whenever they're trying to figure out um, what to do, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember what it is. I th- Man, it's so bad that I just watched this film, but I'm just <laughs> trying to think about everything going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, that Gale ends up being uh, chased by Ghostface down to, like, the basement where they both fall down, essentially. Yeah, they, like, struggle, and she kicks through the door, and they fall down the stairs. That's what it was. She was going to call Sydney, I think, and then mm-hmm. starts getting dragged off whenever right. they go to the main room. Uh, and they both fall down the stairs. And I love that the ghost face is, like, I'm guessing unconscious. He's, like, laying there. Yeah. But then does a stab and lays down. And I do love that Gale calls Dewey. Mm-hmm. And it's like, help, I need you to come down to the basement. Ghostface has me cornered there. And then he's like, how do I know this is <laughs> Yes, it? and yeah. she's like, open the door, damn it. Right. Like, and I love that they don't do, like, what's something the real Gale would say? Right, it's just, yeah, I thought Gale's that like, was going to happen. Dewey, stop being stupid, I understand, but stop being stupid. Right, and open the, yeah, and so he does open the door, and he goes to shoot her, but then, yeah, he, he already used all six shots on the six mirror panels. In the yes, so, exactly. So he clicks, and then, yeah, they both get kind of beat up. And oh, with you're, you're forgetting about the most beautiful beautiful knife throw oh yeah the perfect knife throw i do love that it. that the hilt of the blade knocks him out yeah i'm sure he was going for the kill but i love that they were realistically like yeah you can't just throw a knife and expect for it the the blade part to hit every time <laughs> yeah and meanwhile ghostface like we take those yeah, we take those yeah, cool 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 doing that and then that's how uh, basically now that gale and dewey has been caught that's the perfect bait to grab Sydney because whenever uh, Ghostface calls uh, Sydney on the phone, there essentially, I think this is like the second time she was talked to in the film by Ghostface. I think because mm-hmm. there was the first one at her house, yeah, and then this one, and basically he's just like relishing in the fact that he's like, "Yep, I'm going to make you come to me," essentially right. there, and drag him out and. Again, I love that Sydney is so smart in this film. She mm-hmm. is so stupidly smart with it that she's like, hey, before heading over there, I'm in a detective's office with the pizza party going on. Right. Let me I'm... make sure that I grab a gun. <laughs> yes, I'm going to grab a gun, essentially. And a bulletproof vest, which comes yeah. in handy later. <laughs> yes, yes, very, very handy later. And I love that whenever she does arrive there, I don't know how to feel about this. I love and hate it at the same point. Mm -hmm. That ghost face is like, they're, you know, used a metal detector on you. And it's like, I buy it, but I'm also like, I feel like it's more of a trick for the audience than it is like actual ghost face there. But also, I also buy it because I'm sure like the ghost face is like, I've I've seen how this has gone down two times already. Right, he's already been mm. gunned down once before. He's like, I'm not gonna just like 
invite somebody who would love to see me dead here to, and again to, and let them come in with yeah. a weapon yeah and i love that sydney does it half acidly there at first and he's like no nah, you missed that other leg and she's like <sighs> and does it it's like yep throw the gun in the pool mm -hmm. all right now you can come inside right. essentially and uh whenever she walks in essentially ghostface is there and uh he's immediately gunned down but the thing that gets me is like She's gone through this multiple times, and I know it's, like, probably a trope to fulfill. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't she already be aiming for the head at this point? Right! Yes. Yeah, yeah, that is a little bit, like, come on. Come on. Yeah, a little bit, but at the same point, I feel like the headshot has always been the finishing blow. Right. Essentially, so I get it. So I'm, like, a little mixed on that. Not to mention Dewey just kind of mentioning, like, hey, maybe don't shoot at his torso This ghost face seems to be wearing a bulletproof vest. Because right, I right. shot him multiple times. But then again... I don't know if it's a Dr. Loomis moment. I shot him six times! Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, but yeah, because they, yeah, they did kind of set up with Randy's mm -hmm. video or whatever. They were like, you're not going to be able to just shoot this guy or whatever. Anything short of cutting off his head and cryogenically freezing it or whatever. They're like, all bets are off. The yeah. Guy. So, I mean, like, from an audience perspective, that's what they were setting up. But yeah, from, like, a real character perspective. Yeah. yeah like, but, I, the head. <laughs> but I do love that Sydney does not hesitate. Right. So she's like, scream at this. <laughs> yeah, I do love that. I'm, yeah, because so many times those, those heroines are like... <laughs> tell me about my mother or whatever yeah. <laughs> that's so bad i would have been true. i would have been like bro like she's just like no like this guy needs to be pumped full of lead right now yeah like i am done messing around i am yeah. tired yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of this but i do love that's the other thing that i'm like okay it's gunned down and i know you want to rescue gail and dewey mm-hmm they're not going anywhere. Right, right. They're tied to the chair. Right, right. Double tap. Right. Double tap. But I get it. It just, it allows for other stuff to happen because mm -hmm. the body disappears and then Ken Cade appears and he's pointing the gun and it, he just look, he looks way too sus to be innocent right, at that right. point. Yeah, absolutely. Which again, he's been one of the prime suspects because he's been diving into case, loves movies. So you're like, okay, is this like the reveal there mm -hmm. essentially? And there was also like an element of like, where was he at the police party mm -hmm. or whatever? Because, because he was like, it seemed like Ghostface mm -hmm. had eyes there. They're like, don't talk to anyone, just get out or whatever. Yeah. And that's like the thing too, because like the thing about Kincaid is that I haven't talked about him at all. Although he did have some great great one-liners um wallace uh played by josh uh pace who was the like the the, the, the sidekick yeah, essentially yeah. to there i love one of them <laughs> that's what it was that that whenever kincaid and him are investigating the scene at stab earlier they're like uh -huh. what makes you think uh the killer has anything to do with the production he stabs people <laughs> right right <laughs> he's like two people died getting stabbed yeah yeah like that's all like, i need the movie's called stab <laughs> yes you are a suspect period right. essentially mm -hmm. there um so i i did love that as well um but that because that's the thing that's the interesting thing leading up to this film there's always been two killers that has yeah. always been the big giant twist aroni right, to this right. there um and so you're expecting like okay maybe it's the two of them essentially because yeah. they work together as Partners a group there crime. yes exactly but as it is ghostface takes out a uh, kincaid overall mm -hmm. uh for realsies no uh catch up right, <laughs> or anything right. else like that um i do love that they're just beating the shit out of ghostface though essentially yeah. like and they're not rocked. like they're not doing the standing screaming freaking out they're like mm -hmm. no get his ass essentially right and unfortunately, Sydney misses her last shot, which I do love that he does that little duck hunt pop up thing, mm -hmm. like doing that. Um, but yeah, and then one oh my god, I totally forgot about. Um, how can I forget about this, man? Okay, I got to talk about this before the ending. Okay. I remember about the Randy counterpart. What happened? Yeah. He was running down that hallway on the long ass rug, uh, and Ghostface oh, grabs yeah! it, and he does like a flip. The flip, the <laughs> Los Looney Tunes ass Scooby Doo kill. <laughs> I, I couldn't I was like who was the rug oh yeah, it yeah. was the Randy that counterpart was, yeah, yeah that that was that was so good mm -hmm. especially how violent the flip was on Randy's part just going yeah. whoa and then getting yeah like thrown through a window yeah yeah doing that anyways and so basically he's beating down and uh I love that you know the ghost face runs away there and then uh, King Kate's like take my gun mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially um 
and that was the other oh i didn't even mention how much i did love the fact that cindy's able to pull out a gun in the first place right because she had two guns with her right just to do that so that was also a thing that i'm like that yeah. is incredibly smart because it was revealed that she had a gun earlier when she was at her house or whatever and mm-hmm. she pulled out the gun that yeah she, so it's like yeah okay, i'm glad she was carrying both yeah and it doesn't feel cheap it feels right. like wow that right. was well written there mm-hmm. makes sense essentially and so um as basically she's trying to chase him down they through crazy events end up uh at the screening room and everything Mm -hmm. which is where the killer is revealed and it wasn't two people it was just one guy roman yes old roman the director of stab Mm -hmm. and uh and it's revealed that not only is he the killer but he is sydney's half brother right um from that that woman Yes, from Sydney's... Which is funny that he's named Roman, and the mother has been compared to Sharon Tate. You mentioned it, oh, Sharon Tate, or whatever, in the first film. Uh, Sharon Stone, Sharon I think. Stone, yes. oh, that's, that makes more sense. <laughs> Still, Roman's probably not a great name to name. If, for a movie about Hollywood, mm-hmm. they made, named the bad guy a director, Roman. <laughs> This has got to be, this has got to be a gaffe, right? Harvey, yeah. Roman. Roman. <laughs> they were out for blood in this one, let me tell you what. You thought Ghostface was, no, 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 the filmmakers were. Um, yeah, and I remember the first time I'm like, really, like, it's a half-brother, mm-hmm. that's what we're going with, but if you look at the film, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah, it it yeah, really yeah. does, because again, like, she was... Uh, Sydney's mom did sleep around and I think the thing the first time I watched it I think I got mad because I misinterpreted it as it's undoing everything the first film did like yeah. saying like oh Billy and Stu didn't uh, kill Sydney's mom it was actually Roman or something like that but right. no that's not what happens essentially yeah. Roman's the one that showed the evidence that Billy's dad was cheating on his mom right. with Sydney's mom mm-hmm. and basically was the one to light the match essentially right. and light the fuse so that everything happens for a reason because basically whenever Roman you know figures out who his mom is and tries mm-hmm. to go there she's like I don't know what you're talking about she's dead essentially basically right. disowning him right then and there as opposed to accepting him and he's like so I just exist for no reason, essentially. Like, right. I'm just literally a, a byproduct of you wanting to be in Hollywood. Yeah. And so then he dedicates his whole life to trying to set this up. And again, right. he didn't have the plan for it. He's just like, I just want her dead. Mm-hmm. And But I knew I didn't want to do it, so I had somebody else do it. Right. That was also fueled by it. And I, I'm going to be honest. While I still love Billy and Stu being the original Ghostface mm-hmm. Killers... This one isn't as bad as I remembered, like yeah. the, the solo one. Not to mention, uh, that's the thing that Rainy talks about, like, <clears throat> everything you know is a lie. Subvert your expectations. And what's the thing that's set up from the first one that blew our minds? That there's two killers. Mm-hmm. And what did they do in the second film? Two killers. Yeah. They subverted our expectations as the audience by having one killer. Mm-hmm. Just one flying solo there. Because, again, I never thought watching it even though i knew there was one killer like oh is there any point where there could have been two killers and i'm like no it, it's all believable that it could be one guy right right it's one of those things where they've set up so many people that could be it and you've seen the other two movies presumably that you're like there's probably two killers mm-hmm. right but yeah 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 it's it's pretty smart of them to, to make it so there's mm-hmm. so many suspects but it's just mm-hmm. one yeah and i do love like this the, the scott foley who played uh roman is like just bitchy, whiny, complaining, nerdy, mm-hmm. drunk guy, whatever. Yeah. And then at this one, it's just a mental switch. Right. Sort of like alter ego. And he's just like, yep, it's me. <laughs> there. And I also love that while Sydney's getting this exposition, she is sort of like, what the hell? But at the same point, like, I don't give a fuck. Right. Like, and I <laughs> just love stop that. Just trying to kill me. <laughs> yes, exactly. She's like, you know, you know these people didn't make you kill you decide who you kill there right, right. and then he's like <clears throat> i think you're wrong there in fact i'm going to frame you for the murder because everyone knows that you're unhinged and if they find out about what they did to your mother you'll take it out on milton himself essentially mm-hmm. and i have your voice because i'm able to replicate your voice right of the recording there so you're screwed and she's like i do not care i am killing you right, right now right, right. <clears throat> 
You know, it's like, um, oh, oh, you're approaching me. I can't kick your ass without getting close. Right. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> like, is, I, like very, <laughs> very Jotaro-esque mentality of, like, I do not care. I am killing you right here and now. Right. And I love that. I love that there is sort of, like, the, you know, no, I am your father. No, no. Right, right. There's that. that. He's just like, I'm going to fuck you up. Yes, essentially. And they do have, like, just a fun fight there, essentially, as they're trying to break... Uh, through, uh, cause they have like the bookshelf there, which mm-hmm. that was the most long bookshelf trying to pull something to try to get through there essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but whenever Gail and Dewey are free essentially, and they start trying to get at her, um, Dewey gets the bright idea of turning off the lights during this. Cause I do, I do love that. I don't know. That is the one thing I will say. I do love that each of the films, final scene like the killer reveal takes place at very thematic places like the first one uh takes place at um i'm trying to remember it was Stu's house there and everything else and so it's just sort of like the home mentality not to mention it's the place where um sydney lost her virginity which has been like a big Um, talk of that like you know oh you're gonna die so there is that second one right on stage so Mm -hmm. it's like right there a show Third one is in a little screening theater. Yeah, They're yeah. very much movie meta, essentially. Yes, for so sure. So I do love that. And so whenever the power cuts off, because it was showing, like, home video of the mom, mm-hmm. which I did find a little bit cheesy that they yeah. did the mom thing again, because how the fuck could he know that she has that sort of trauma there? That's yeah. about the only thing I would say, unless... Because she was already trauma- traumatized by seeing the mom death mm-hmm. before, unless he's able to guess, like, I'm sure she's probably traumatized. Why not? Right, and I think it was also his evil villain monologue to be like, this is my mom too, Sydney." you know, yeah. Yes, and doing... that's why I'm killing you. <laughs> yeah, doing that. Um, I felt like the motivation was fine. Yeah, um, that's how I felt. Just I, I still love the... F- I still love Billy and Stu's motivation Same. the best. Mm-hmm. So, while it is weaker, I do like it better than a simple... Well, I mean, I guess in two they say it's simply revenge, you know? Yeah. And I'm like... I mean, good on you, not overcomplicating it, but it still kind of is weak. Right. But I felt like it was fine. But I do love the final fight because, again, Sydney is, like, throwing equal punches as much as Roman is. That's yeah. the thing I love about Sydney being the final girl. Like, she... Uh, she's down yeah. to scrap. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so, as they're trying to... Um, it is kind of shocking because, again, they set up the whole mentality as well of, like, you know, Sydney, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter if you're the final girl. You could die in this film because this is the end of the trilogy. Right, yeah. Essentially. Yeah, they, they do kind of make that a point. And, you know, while uh, Roman does start cutting and stabbing her, he finally pulls out a gun and just shoots her. Yeah. <laughs> and twice, essentially. And you're like, oh, holy hell. But then whenever the power goes out the body disappears mm-hmm. so it's like the it's ghost like, yes yeah, sydney's doing ghost face move yeah yeah doing that and you don't see her and they start panicking and so then what's great is uh roman's like i know how to find her i'll call her cell phone mm-hmm. and then before he knows it she has called his cell phone back there because mm-hmm. that was like the interesting like reverse dial thing that's yeah. like new back in the day that they knew that the ghost face killer was here in this house because mm-hmm. they see the voice changer and the cell phone and the outfit Mm -hmm. and i love that roman's able to get the outfit because the outfit is downstairs essentially right Right. which is why it works out again it's really nicely laid out uh but again whenever sydney comes over the counter it stabs him with like the knife there Mm -hmm. essentially um I'm trying to remember a sequence of events. Everything flies together. Cause I think during the blackout, Kincaid also breaks into the room there. Yeah. And as well, he breaks yeah. in and he's trying to like, he's mm-hmm. like, Sydney, are you okay? Like, where is he? And then Ghostface beats him up or whatever. Yeah. And then I love that he tries to get the gun from him. And he's like, oh, okay, of course the big gun's gone. Right. But then he's able to find like the other gun and mm-hmm. use that essentially. Yeah, right. His little pocket pistol. Or yeah. Doing that. Um, but as soon as like he's stabbed or whatever it's kind of like weird almost because like whatever he's stabbed in the back and then falls over sydney stabs him directly in the heart there yeah and they almost have like sort of like a sad moment together as weird as it is where Mm -hmm. they're like 
instead of him like cursing her name or whatever he just grips her hand tightly there essentially right. like well, they're both kind of hurt by what the mom did yeah, yeah. that's sort of the thing and there's they, they definitely set up to be alike because they are technically half siblings or whatever and so mm-hmm. he's like i shot you and she shows the lapd vest or whatever yes that was like i guess we think alike or whatever i thought that was a great line. So, which is why like <laughs> yeah. yes she's kind of stealing ghost face moves a little bit because they are both you know of the cut from the same cloth i guess you could say but yeah um because that was also just like a funny thing just to confirm that bull- ghost face was a bulletproof they showed before mm-hmm. the reveal that is roman that he's like yeah i have one of these as well right you know? <laughs> so yeah that was a great reveal there but of course they have like the classic like we better watch out. They say he's superhuman. Mm-hmm. And then he comes up screaming like a psychopath. And Dewey's screaming, unloading into him. Right. And said, he's like, the Dewey, head, the, the head, head, the head. <laughs> Shoot the head. Shoot the, the head. head. Because he's literally being shot and still screaming like right. unkillable. And they get, he's like, shoots him in the head finally. He's like, thanks. No problem. Yep. <laughs> yeah, like, just, like very dry and direct there. Yeah. And, um. The one thing I will say that I do love how this film ends is the fact that um, it's 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 like pretty cliche in a lot of parts, but also I buy it there. Like you know, Dewey's like sign my book, and she's like you hated this thing. He's like, yeah, but I want you to sign it to me, and mm-hmm. then opens it up, and there's like there's the, the wedding ring, ring yeah. and it's just like oh, yeah, doing that, and then it shows that Sydney is feeling like a lot more free, like she's not locking the gate behind her, mm-hmm. and then there's a moment whenever she's trying to set the alarm, and she's like. You know what? I don't think I need to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Granted, it doesn't matter if I, the killer I knew was dead. Old I'm habits are going to die hard. Yeah. <laughs> but I know it's supposed to be symbolic, and it shows Kincaid be like, hey, we're going to watch a movie on the couch. Mm-hmm. Can you guess what it is or whatever? Doing yeah. that. And then as she walks away, she sees the door is open, and then she just smiles and leaves it open. That was the scariest thing. Her right. AC bill's going to be really high. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's how the film wraps up. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I do agree. It does deserve a... Yeah, well, in that's point. Yeah, so, um... Holy hell, how about that film, huh? How about that? How about that? How about that? How about them bears, right? Oh. Hell of a game. Hey, how about that next film? What are yeah, we watching oh, next? Damn! Look at that transition! <laughs> what am I going to do with that? Okay, so this next film, I doubt you have ever heard of. Okay, great. So, you, you know, um, uh, I, I will have to do two words because okay, it's great. a film from 2008 and I believe it's made in Australia. Oh. Okay. Uh, and uh, the... Two words. Uh-huh, uh-huh. First word sure. is a big body of water. Lake. Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Halfway there. Woo! Halfway there. All right, this, all right. this one's going to be a stretch. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this one's going to channel into the cursed knowledge of League of Legends. Oh. Just just to try to do okay. that. All right, all right, all right. Okay. So think of a big hulking purple guy that's... Yorick? Spe- uh, 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 Mundo. Yes, yes, Lake, yes, 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 yes. Mundo? Yeah, uh, close, close, Lake close. World? Change, change the D to <laughs> a different letter that rhymes with D. <laughs> Mupo. <laughs> Mun- Mupo. And, and um, P- it, it, it shares P D B. Uh, it's e. <laughs> it's it's the second letter in the uh band's name that made uh. Staying alive, you know, they got the B and they got the G. Okay, all right, so Mungo, yes, yes. <laughs> all right, I, I was just like, I'm literally just going to try to end this real quickly so yeah. that way none of us die there. So, yes, <laughs> like Mungo, yes, exactly. All right, that's sure. exactly it. All right, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. We'll see y'all again next time when we're popping the scary with Lake Mungo. Yeah, now we're gonna Mungo, <laughs> Mungo, go where he pleases. <laughs> Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube, CastBox, or iTunes platforms to stay up to date when new episodes drop. To see what Aaron and I are up to, check out our respective Twitter accounts. For me, it is at ColkirkVA, and for Aaron, it is at AnimalGameDev. Thank you all so much for listening to our podcast. We'll speak to you all again next time when we're popping the scary.